Western Europe was burning. The Roman Empire had, for generations, kept civilization safe and the barbarians at bay. While villagers tended to their daily life in the plains of Gaul, Roman legions fought hard against the constantly invading Germanic tribes. This was the status quo for centuries. Of course, the occasional Germanic horde would break through Roman lines and devastate the Roman countryside, but for the most part, things were relatively safe. And then, with infighting and economic issues, the Romans became weaker. These invaders crossed the border and raided the interior more often. From usurpers and pretenders, secessionists and barbarians, the fields of Gaul steadily became less and less safe. Finally, it was becoming clear that the Roman Empire was on the verge of collapse. Emperor Majorian ordered military officer Agidius to keep control over Gaul in 457 CE, but Majorian was assassinated in 461 CE in a coup led by the Germanic Roman Ricimer. Agidius decided to continue Majorian's orders and refused to follow the illegitimate Roman government, effectively breaking the fallen Gaul away from the rest of the empire. Nevertheless, Agidius' new Kingdom of Soissons faced invasion by Visigoths and Burgundian Germanic hordes, only barely managing to keep hold of the northeast, bordering another Germanic tribe known as the Franks. The Franks were well known to the Romans, originally forming a collection of West Germanic tribes like the Cherusci, Chatti, and Batavians, who, as one unit, fought the Roman Empire during the 260s CE, pushing as far as Hispania and running rampant for a decade, until they were ultimately pushed back. Over the years, the Franks had developed a unique relationship with the Roman Empire, in contrast to the relationships the Empire had with other tribes. At times, the Franks seemingly wished to emulate the Romans and their civilization, and though there were certainly times they were enemies, there were also times when the Franks served the Romans as allies. However, the gradual fall of the Roman Empire complicated things. By the time of the fall, the Franks, or rather, a specific tribe known as the Salian Franks, were under the control of the unusually long-haired Merovingian dynasty, a dynasty descended from Frankish leaders placed in charge by the Roman Empire and well integrated into the Roman systems. Though they descend from the Roman collaborator Clodio, this dynasty was named after his descendant Merovec of which we know very little about. Some sources seem to suggest that Merovec was a son of Clodio, who may have been adopted by the Roman officer Flavius Aetius. Merovec may have been in a dispute for the Salian Frankish throne with other siblings which may have been used as an opportunity to strike by the Hunnic Empire. Under this theory, Merovec would have served with the Romans in the Battle of the Catalaunian Plains in 451 CE. Merovic's son Kilderic, on the other hand, properly starts the story of the Merovingian dynasty and post-Roman Frankish history. From this point, the Franks would rise until they eventually became the countries that brought the light of Rome back to the Western world, and their Frankish empire, or Francia, would become the father of Europe, founding nation-states we know of today. This documentary will focus on the beginnings of the Merovingian dynasty, their rise to power, and the life of their king, Clovis, who brought Christianity to the Franks. Kilderic is said to have come to the throne of the Frankish kingdom in 458 CE, but though he was the son of the great Merovec, he himself was not so much a man of character. In fact, he is described as a wanton ruler who frequently dishonored the daughters of the Franks. 
The Franks were outraged at their ruler and rose up to kill him. Kilderic met with a close friend and split a gold coin with him. When it would be the time to return to his throne, his friend would send the other half of the coin to Kilderic as a signal to come home. And so, Kilderic fled his realm to the neighboring land of Thuringia, living with King Bissinus and Queen Bassina. In the meantime, the kingdom of Soissons under Agidius moved in to keep order in the land of the Franks, while Kilderic's unnamed friend worked to turn public favor back in the direction of Kilderic. Eventually, after eight years, the Franks began to miss their old king, and Kilderic received the second half of the coin. Kilderic victoriously returned to the Frankish kingdom, assuming his place on the throne once again and liberating his realm from Soissons occupation. It wasn't long afterward that Queen Bassina arrived at Kilderic's home, explaining that she had fallen in love with Kilderic while he was in Thuringia, and that she wanted to be with him and not her husband. Together, they would have a child, a young boy who would be known as Clovis, and the future great king of the Franks. Kilderic continued to lead the Franks to greatness, allying with the Soissons Romans in battles against other Germanic invaders, like the Battle of Orléans against Theodoric II of the Visigoths. Saxons also had penetrated deep into Gaul, and Kilderic led the Franks to victory against them, crushing the Saxon king Adovacrius on land and at sea, and joining sides with a Roman count named Paul to do so. Despite plagues and earthquakes, the Franks continued to push against the other Germanics. Though the Franks were working with Soissons, they also worked with Odoacer and his Germanic Kingdom of Italy that had destroyed the Western Roman Empire, to face off against the Alemanni who were present in Gaul. Though Kilderic had led the Franks in many victorious campaigns in the chaos that was the fall of Rome, he was nothing compared to his son Clovis, who would succeed him following Kilderic's death in 481 CE. In the fifth year of Clovis's reign, Clovis and his relative, the Thuringian Ragnacar, worked together to launch an attack on the Roman rump state of the Kingdom of Soissons. These men saw the territory held in northern Gaul as rightful Frankish territory, and they sought to make it their own. Clovis, eager to prove himself, demanded King Siagrius of Soissons to prepare a battlefield, which Siagrius did with glee, eager to wipe out the barbarian menace. And so, the Franks and Romans did battle, a battle that ended in the utter destruction of the Romans. Defeated, Siagrius fled to the court of King Alaric II of the Visigoths, their traditional enemy. The power dynamic in Gaul had shifted dramatically since the fall of Rome, and Clovis demanded Alaric to surrender Siagrius to him, or to prepare for war. Afraid of the Franks and wishing to avoid war, Alaric sent Siagrius to Clovis in chains. Clovis kept Siagrius in prison while he occupied Soissons, before secretly ordering his execution. In 486 CE, the Kingdom of Soissons, the last remnant of the Western Roman Empire, had fallen. It was now the spoils of the Frankish Kingdom, and so the pagan Franks began to pillage, especially the Christian churches. One story goes that the Franks stole a large, beautiful vase from a church, and the local bishop asked Clovis for the vase to be returned. Clovis agreed if the bishop's messenger were to come to Soissons, where the loot of the war was being divided. Clovis and the bishop's messenger gathered in Soissons, and Clovis demanded his underlings to give him his equal share in addition to the vase. And while the other Franks had agreed that the king held priority, one foolish soldier with a battle axe struck the vase, declaring that Clovis would get nothing beyond what would be equally shared among the Franks. This stunned the audience of the king, but Clovis endured the insult, taking the vase and handing it to the church's messenger. Flash forward to the end of the year when Clovis had assembled the Frankish army to review their armor, finding the battle-axe-wielding Frankish soldier who opposed him before. 
Inspecting his armor, Clovis said, No one has brought armor so carelessly kept as you, for neither spear, nor sword, nor axe is in serviceable condition. In saying so, Clovis grabbed the man's axe and threw it to the ground. As the warrior leaned down to pick up his axe, Clovis took his own axe and cut into the warrior's head. This is what you did at Soissons to the vase, Clovis sneered. Following the death of the warrior, Clovis ordered the Franks to depart, earning himself a reputation among the ranks of the Frank warriors. In his first ten years of his reign, Clovis had led the Franks to great victories, conquering not only Soissons, but the Thuringi as well. The Frankish kingdom under Clovis did not conduct relations with other powers simply through warfare, although that was admittedly Clovis's strong suit. But diplomacy was used as well through the use of traveling embassies sent by the Franks to other countries. During one such embassy to the neighboring kingdom of Burgundy to the southeast, which was dominated by the Germanic Burgundians who carved their own peace out of Gaul, the Frankish embassy met a woman named Clotilde. Clotilde was the granddaughter of King Gondiac and the daughter of a man named Kilperic, who had been killed by his own brother. The Franks observed that Clotilde was an intelligent and resourceful woman, and she was a suitable wife for King Clovis. After all, Clovis was looking for a wife to produce a legitimate heir, though he already had the son Theuderic with a concubine. After explaining their discovery to the king, Clovis asked the king of Burgundy for Clotilde's hand in marriage. Partially fearing that the Frankish kingdom would conquer Burgundy should he refuse, the king of Burgundy accepted Clovis's proposal, and the two were married. However, problems soon arose within the marriage between Clovis and Clotilde. For one, Clovis was the pagan king of a pagan land, while Clotilde herself was a Christian. Upon the birth of their first son, Ingomer, the two argued about a Christian baptism for the child. Clotilde was insistent that Ingelmer receive his baptism, but Clovis was against it. Finally, Clotilde set up the baptism, but the infant died mere moments after his baptism, still wearing his white garments. Clovis was outraged at the death of his son and claimed that, had Ingelmer been dedicated in the name of his gods and not hers, Ingelmer would still be alive. However, Clotilde believed that Ingelmer's death happened for God's own reasoning. Ingelmer was never meant by the Creator to stay in this earthly realm for long. Not long afterwards, the two had another son, Clodomer. However, after his baptism, Clodomer became ill as well. King Clovis said that Clodomer would die just like Ingomer, and that Clotilde's god could not save their son. However, Clotilde continued her prayers to God, and Clodomer became well, surprising Clovis. Despite the incident, Clotilde still could not convince Clovis to convert to Christianity. The year was 496 CE. Ten years after the fall of Soissons, and twenty years after the fall of the Roman Empire. A neighboring group of Franks called the Ripuarian Franks under King Sigobert fell under attack by Alamanni Germanic forces. In order to support his Frankish allies, Clovis took charge of the troops and countered the Alamanni in the Battle of Tolbiac. The battle was fierce and bloody as Frankish soldiers began to fall one by one. It started to seem to Clovis that he was going to lose the battle and the kingdom he had worked so hard to build. Desperate, Clovis prayed in remorse. Jesus Christ, whom Clotilda asserts to be the son of the living God, who art said to give aid to those in distress and to bestow victory on those who hope in thee, I beseech the glory of thy aid with the vow that if thou wilt grant me victory over these enemies, and I shall know that power which she says that people dedicated in thy name have had from thee, I will believe in thee and be baptized in thy name. For I have invoked my own gods, but, as I find, they have withdrawn from aiding me, and therefore I believe that they possess no power since they do not help those who obey them. 
I call now upon thee. I desire to believe thee only let me be rescued from my adversaries. And, to Clovis's surprise, the prayer worked. The Alemanni king was slain, and, upon seeing this, the Alemanni turned back and fled from the battlefield in great numbers. With no leader, the Alemanni are said to have surrendered and submitted to the Franks, declaring Clovis to be their king and throwing themselves at his mercy. Clovis congratulated his men and returned home where he privately spoke with Queen Clotilde about what had happened at the Battle of Tolbiac. He had won victory simply by calling on the name of Christ and that the old gods had abandoned him. In secret, Clotilda contacted Remigius, the Bishop of Rheims, and who would later be venerated as a saint, who came to speak to Clovis about Christianity, a conversation that Clovis was open to hearing. While Clovis had accepted Arianism, a Christian sect that was widely seen as a heresy, it was Saint Remigius that helped Clovis convert to the proper Orthodox Catholic Church. Clovis agreed with the doctrines of Christianity, but was hesitant to do so in public, as his pagan realm wished to have a pagan king, surely. Nevertheless, Clovis went to speak with the Franks, and, to his surprise, they are said to have expressed that they wished to become Christians. There was a time of great rejoicing in Francia, as Saint Remigius, forever to be known as the Apostle of the Franks, orchestrated a great gathering where he preached and, starting with Clovis himself, provided baptisms for the Franks, properly bringing the Frankish nation into Christianity and bringing Orthodox Catholicism into the realm. 3,000 Frankish warriors were said to be converted, becoming Christian soldiers. It was a time of tapestries, incense, and candles. It was a time of paradise in Francia, the Holy Empire. So began the Gallican Church. By the year 500 CE, the Kingdom of Burgundy was ruled by the brothers King Gundobad and sub-King Godegizel. This Arianist Germanic kingdom was undergoing political intrigue as Godegizel sought to take control of the kingdom himself. After hearing of Clovis's great victories for the Franks, he arranged a secret deal with the Franks that the Franks would militarily support his bid for the throne, and, in return, Godegazel's kingdom would pay tribute to Francia. Clovis agreed to the arrangement. And so, the Franks set out for Burgundy. Gundobad knew not of his brother's treachery and asked for Godegazel's support in repulsing the Franks. Godegazel agreed and mobilized his forces. The Franks and Burgundians met in the fields of Dijon, where Godegazel made his betrayal known as he joined with Clovis. Gundabad was crushed in the battle and fled to Avignon. Godegazel ceded some Burgundian land to Francia and assumed his tributary status to Francia, bringing victory in Burgundy. In the meantime, Clovis expanded his army and marched out against Gundabad. However, Gundabad had a wise and charismatic friend named Aridius, and the exiled king confided with his friend. Aridius decided to pretend to defect to the Frankish side and to convince Clovis to spare Gundabad's life and kingdom. Gundabad simply had to accept whatever Aridius could get Clovis to send. And so, Aridius did just that and convinced Clovis to accept Gundabad and his land as a tributary fief as well. Gundabad quickly accepted the offer and promised to continue to pay his tribute. This moment of relief did not last, as in 501 CE, Gundabad ceased selling tribute to Francia and launched a coup against Godegazel, surrounding his capital in Vienne and storming it. Frankish soldiers were present in Vienne when it fell, but Gundabad gave orders not to harm the Franks. Instead, the Franks were captured and sent to Alaric II of the Visigothic Kingdom to the west. Gundabad slew his brother and the Burgundian Senate, taking full control over Burgundy himself. While Clovis did not take direct action against the treacherous Burgundians, he did meet with King Alaric II of the Visigoths, who wished to avoid war. In return for some lost Visigothic territories, Alaric II returned the Frankish hostages to Clovis.
However, tensions between the two states were rising, especially as the Franks believed the Christians living under Visigothic rule wanted to be under the rule of an Orthodox Catholic leader and not the Arianist Visigoths. Despite the attempt at peace in 501 CE, Clovis collected and integrated fellow Orthodox Catholic Armoniki in the north of Gaul and launched an invasion of Visigothic territories in 507 CE, seeking to liberate the Orthodox Catholics of Gaul. The Visigothic and Frankish armies met in the Battle of Voile. Voile. I don't know how to say this. Voile. 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 The Visigothic and Frankish armies met in the Battle of Vouye. After fierce fighting where Clovis was supported by his fellow Frankish noble and the son of Sigobert, Cloderic, the Franks were victorious. Clovis himself barely managed to escape death on one occasion, where two Visigoths attempted to lance him, but he was protected by his armor, and Clovis himself is said to have slain Alaric in the battle. The great-grandson of the more famous Alaric I, who sacked Rome in 410, had been killed in action. The Visigoths, in a panic, fled the battlefield. The Visigoths' hold on Gaul weakened, especially as the Burgundians and even the Ostrogoths based in Italy made moves against them. Francia became the dominant power in Gaul and the protector of the Orthodox Catholic Church in the region. In return for his liberation of Gaul from the Visigoths, Emperor Anastasius of the Byzantine Empire allied his Roman remnant state with Francia and dubbed Clovis as a consul of Rome, complete with purple robes and the ceremonial title of Augustus. Clovis enjoyed his new prestige with a victory march that celebrated his holy, almost Roman, empire, while his son Theodoric continued the Frankish campaigns to oust the Visigoths. With his victory in the Frankish-Visigothic Wars and the incorporation of the region of Aquitaine, Clovis made Paris the capital of his empire. With the Visigoths pacified, Clovis turned his attention to the Franks themselves, as they had not all sworn loyalty to Clovis yet. King Sigilbert remained in charge of the Ripuarian Franks, though he was now an old man. Scheming, Clovis secretly met with Cloderic, the son of Sigilbert, who had served with him at his victory at Voye. Clovis enticed Cloderic, claiming that, should Sigilbert die, the Ripuarian Franks would be Cloderic's to rule alongside a close relationship with Clovis. Driven by greed, Cloderic ordered assassins to kill his father while he slept, and Cloderic took charge of his kingdom himself. Salian Frank officials were sent to confirm the situation as Cloderic bragged of the riches he had inherited. Cloderic even plunged his hand into one of his treasure chests to show its depth. While he was leaning down, a Salian Frank raised his battle axe and murdered the usurper. It was at this point where King Clovis gathered the Ripuarian Franks and addressed them, proclaiming that Sigilbert had been killed by the greedy Cloderic, and that Cloderic himself had been killed in a way that Clovis knew nothing of. According to Clovis, it would be best if the Ripuarian Franks submitted to the Salians, and the people did so, cheering praise to Clovis and raising him on their shields. Back during the war with the Soissons, the Frankish chief Cararic simply stood by and watched the battle play out as he wished to side with whoever won the battle, King Clovis or King Siagrius. Clovis had been outraged at the scheming of Cararic, but did not feel able to take action until now, sending forces to capture Cararic and forcing him and his son to fill religious roles. Upon hearing that the Cararic family was plotting rebellion, Clovis ordered them to be killed, formally annexing their realms. Meanwhile, the Thuringian Ragnacar, a relative of Clovis who had supported him in the war with Soissons, had become a cruel ruler of the Frankish city of Cambrai. He and his counselor Pharaoh ruled cruelly, and should food show up in the kingdom, Ragnacar would proclaim that it was just enough for himself and Pharaoh keeping it for themselves. As Clovis was consolidating his power within the Franks, Clovis marched out against Ragnacar. 
Ragnarkar's spies were sent to report on the size of Clovis' army, but they simply replied that the army was enough for Ragnarkar and Pharaoh. Clovis' forces seized Cambrai and captured Ragnarkar and his brother Rikkar, brought before Clovis. Why have you humiliated our family in permitting yourself to be bound? It would have been better for you to die. Clovis chided Ragnarkar before raising his battle axe and personally executing his kinsmen, quickly doing the same to his brother. And so, the lands held by the Thuringian noble were brought into Clovis's domain. He had successfully made himself the sole leader of Francia. However, the old Clovis addressed the people in 509 CE, following the consolidation of his rule in Francia, speaking about the realms he had destroyed and the kinsmen he had slain in a woeful manner. He also regretted that Francia had no real allies to speak of. In 511 CE, King Clovis drew his last breath in Paris. He was buried in the Church of the Holy Apostles, which he himself had built with his wife Clotilde. The Queen of Francia left for Tours and served the Church of St. Martin for the remainder of her life. Clovis was dead, and the Golden Age of the Merovingian dynasty had come to an end. Before Clovis, the realm he ruled was known as Gaul, a province with a legacy of belonging to the once great Roman Empire. Though Germanic forces had invaded and pillaged it, the name Gaul remained as a glimmer of hope that one day Rome would come to save its lost child, even as the Latin language turned into the Gallo-Romance languages with Germanic influences. Even after the reign of Clovis, the Gallo-Romance speakers were the majority in both linguistic and cultural areas, along with a Celtic heritage from before the days of even the Roman Republic with things becoming more Germanic and Frankish the further east one went. Through Clovis' invasions, campaigns, and schemings, the land of Gaul had returned not to the Romans, but to a branch of Roman civilization. While it was the Germanic Franks who were invading, they had orders to not assault churches and orders to end the Arianist occupation of Gaul. It was a liberation not by the political institutions of the Roman Empire, but by its religious institutions, as the Orthodox Catholic Franks restored the Orthodox Catholic faith to the land by Clovis's orders. The name of Gaul was cast aside as Francia became the term, a land named after its Orthodox Catholic restorers. A baptismal name, as it were. By the time of Clovis' death, only Burgundy and the coastal Visigothic province of Septimania were parts of Gaul that remained out of Frankian hands. His name would go down in history, slowly transforming into Louis, a name that would remain with the royals of Francia until the modern day. Even to this day, the Roman Catholic Church in France and in southern Italy venerate Clovis as King Saint Clovis, King and new Constantine. And that's going to wrap up this video. I hope you enjoyed. Consider subscribing to the channel if you enjoy or want more sort of history content to see. Um, check out my social media. Uh, links are all in the description, especially my Twitter and Discord server. And yeah, have a great day, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I wanna be